What's up guys and welcome back to Headphones Neil Reviews. I'm your host as always, Headphones Neil, with the latest episode of the show. So this week's episode is going to be a little bit more of a summary than usual just because um, we have one show finishing, one show is almost done, I'm making progress on another show and I have a gameplay update. So um, with that being said, I'm going to start off the bat with the show that finished. So. I had a chance to finish off Loki season two. The, we had a season two finale last week, and overall, I want to say they landed the or they landed the um, finale to a point that I was generally happy with it. Where um, they're trying to fix the loom, they're having trouble with um, he who remains, the variant that they've been dealing with, and they actually go to the point where. They pull a Doctor Strange where Loki is continuing to repeat the past and the conversation to the point where we realize that Loki has already, or we learn that Loki has learned the power of he who remains and they've already had the conversation so that he can figure out the best course of action to take. And we go from Loki the god of mischief to the uh, Loki the god who wants to help others where he integrates himself with the loom, uses his magic to expand it and keep it going. Um, you know, think about like the closest comparison I could think of was um, the Three-Eyed Raven from Game of Thrones, the guy who taught Bran, who integrated with the tree. So that's kind of what Loki did here. So I'm actually kind of curious to see how they integrate that with or if they even did that with the Marvels, what's going to happen going forward. So I will admit that I have not seen the Marvels yet, but I'm kind of intrigued to see how it goes. I know it's getting not very well received in the theaters, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to see it. I kind of do want to see how what that movie's all about and go with that whole thing. Um, but overall, if you've been watching Loki, then I will say that you'll be happy with the finale. They, I, it, To me, it feels like they addressed all of the... Not to say that there were issues, but it kind of started to feel that they were kind of slowing down in the middle of the season. But they ended very well with Obi and um, Mobius and um, Loki integrating with the Loom and all of that. So definitely worth a watch. It was a good show. Very well done. Um, Tom Hiddleston um, played or his acting was very well done. It was top notch. Um, I enjoyed all of it, and not and that goes for every the whole cast. Like, I enjoyed everyone's performance. It all worked well. They integrated and meshed well together. So I definitely recommend giving the show a watch. Now, on the flip side, we have Fear the Walking Dead, where the last episode um, was okay, but um, we're still in that process of dealing with. Um, the guy, or now I'm drawing a blank on the guy's name, but you have um, Madison um, trying to deal with him. You have the rest of the group and everyone pretty much still trying to find Padre. So I'm kind of still holding off judgment for the season finale to see what they do with that. Um, in listening to the Talking Dead podcast, the unofficial one, not the AMC one, um, it sounds like the next two episodes are going to be aired back to back. So with Thanksgiving being the next um, American holiday, I plan to watch them both next week and have the review the week after to see how they round it out. Are we going to finally figure out um, who Padre is? Um, are we going to meet up with Alicia again? And Or is she still alive? Hopefully we find out about her fate. Um, the last episode was kind of a dealing with um, the, cl the cult of um, Alicia, so we have people living or fulfilling her memory and the way she was, which kind of comes from Madison as well. So, in general, not a terrible episode. I kind of liked it, but it's just another episode where we're doing more character development. So, it's hard to see, or for me, it's still kind of hard to see what they're going to do with the finale, but we'll see if maybe they're dealing with the two episodes just to uh, round it out and be done with it, or because it's the Thanksgiving holiday, but. Um, 
that's kind of where I'm expecting. Hopefully we finally do get a resolution with Padre. Maybe it's going to be a super big reveal that maybe it's been Rick all along or something like that. But, um, and you can, if you want, you can count that as my prediction that maybe Padre all along has been, um, Rick, he's been that, he's been that person behind the scenes working for CRM, I want to say, doing what they, like, you know, that whole thing with like, maybe with propaganda or something like that. And he's been putting out that message and that's why he's been hard to find. No one knows who Padre is because he's been, um, his message has only gone out and then the reason uh, nothing's been happening with him is because it deals with um, Rick's escape and all of that so they end that program or something like that so we'll see I mean that's all speculation that might be you know a little bit more speculation and prediction of what's going to happen than they will do but I'll kind of run with that that that's why they've been so secretive and they're biding their time to make the end of fees or the end of Fear of the Walking Dead as close to, um, I want to say they, not he, they who remain, but the ones who live uh, releasing in February of 2024. So we'll see how it all ties together or if anything does tie together and what they do with that. Um, so with that being said, I also had a chance to um, finish Stargate Atlantis Season 4. So overall, the show isn't terrible. Um, I did enjoy the whole thing with um, Colonel Carter being on the show. So uh, those were good episodes. But then at some point you realize, I, wanted, I think I might have mentioned it last week as well, that the show does okay, but it is still trying to deal a lot with... Um, it's kind of, it feels like they're rehashing a lot of the episodes that they had on Stargate SG-1, but now it's with Stargate Atlantis. So Stargate Atlantis actually kind of starts to feel like um, Stargate The Next Generation. It doesn't necessarily feel like it's its own show because it spends too much time dealing with what SG-1 used to do and then integrating some of the stuff with the Wraith. So, you know, things like the Wraith can heal people that they drain energy from but they only reserve that for people who are their family so it comes to that point where i want to cut it almost comes down to i kind of feel like the pacing on stargate sg1 was better with the gold that at least with each um season they kind of progressed what what they presented with the gold so you know the first few seasons dealt a lot with just um anubis but then they brought in things like a lot more stuff with the jaffa um the what they were building up with their culture and their society um and then you build up things like their minions and then the power struggle the symbiotes themselves um i forget where it comes into play with the gould system lords and all that but i remember a early version of that prior to you know people like cronus and um a few other ones but you kind of also see that they're doing that with the race so uh, you know like um shepherd starts giving them names so you have todd and uh michael and a few other ones but you don't really and then you have you know you learn about how their ships are organically grown a little bit and their technology is integrated with that but you don't have it doesn't feel like they do too much or they're trying to make the wraith the new gould but they don't really spend too much time on it um, you have the dealings with the Queen um, coming into season um, five, but there's not a whole lot that they do that they make unique from SG-1. So it kind of feels like they were trying to make the next generation version of SG-1, but because they're repeating the show, except in Atlantis, um, that, I think that's why for me it kind of didn't work because it, it feels like they're kind of continuing to do that. But needless to say, I'm into season five. I'm about a third of the way into it, so... I'm going to round it out, see how they finish um, the show, and I'll do my final review of that, but at least I can say that I've now officially seen all of Stargate Atlantis along the lines of watching all of Stargate SG-1 and Atlantis. Um, with that being said, um, I'm continuing to play Doom 3, so um, I did make the progress report post um, earlier this week where... Um, I've made it through what I assume is the first boss fight. I couldn't make, or I, there's a name online somewhere of what that spider lady is called. Um, but I want to assume that's kind of like the end of the first chapter, because now that you're done with the initial parts of, um, the Mars base, now you have to go to the communications tower and, um, get the message out to the fleet. So as of this recording, I've, uh, finished that. I did send the message off, so I've, um, sided with Sarge and, um made 
uh, Counselor Swan upset, so we'll see how that um, affects the story, if it does at all. Um, but I want to say probably that Communications Tower and that whole part is probably like the unofficial episode 2. So um, overall, a pretty good thing. The darkness is kind of annoying from time to time, but I've gotten to the... Um, I've come to the conclusion that they they make certain parts of the level dark to kind of indicate, make like that visual indicator that enemies are about to come around the corner and you have to defeat enemies. And then the when the lights come back on, that means you've defeated all the enemies. So the early levels are kind of a little bit weak on that, but it feels like as the game progresses, they've gotten a little bit better about that. So while it is still a little bit on the darker side, I think that's what they're trying to go for, that, that when it becomes dark, you do have to switch between your flashlight and weapon. But that just means that enemies are in the area, you have to defeat them when they go away, the lights come back on. So there's that. Um, the only annoying thing that I think is gonna be, a, or the only thing that I think is gonna be a little bit annoying is that, um, what the outdoor levels on Mars were on when you're on the surface and you have to deal with the um, oxygen that I hope that they don't have too much time where you have to spend time looking for um, the oxygen tanks and making sure you uh, have oxygen to spend time to go out and get that and, and spend a lot of time on the surface. I hope they continue with it just being uh, minimal points on the surface where you just have to find the, find the door to get from one building to another, which would be okay. Granted, it's not something that you see in Doom 1 and 2, but Doom 3 seems to be working on the technology to have um, something like that to account for the Mars weather and climate being different than inside the building and that and th of that on Earth. Which get, brings me to the point where I'm actually realizing that Doom 3, which I'm going to also look prior to the next episode, but um it feels like doom 3 is actually more of a prequel story to doom 1 where you have you're learning about usc you're learning about their um the pdas and their structure system and the marines and all that and you become the doom guy by episode by doom 1 because of the events in doom 3 so i'm gonna see if that's the case and kind of do some research to see how um see if that's the case or if that was kind of the intention that they wanted to do a reboot of doom with more modern technology and by creating a prequel story then that kind of solves it because you realize that you know the pdas are the um, um door key cards so rather than looking for a green rather than looking for sorry blue yellow and red keys you're picking up a pda to unlock doors instead of the end of episode um summary cards of what's going on in the game you are picking up pdas to learn the story as you go of different employees uh why storage containers are locked and things like that um so overall i think it's a interesting way of doing what they did in Doom 1, modernizing what they can, but then also presenting a prequel storyline. So why um, are we spending a lot of time on the Mars base early on um, and things like that? So I'm going to kind of do some research on that, see how see where the Doom 3 story fits in with the grand scheme of things, how it fits in between with things like, you know, the uh, Doom 1 and 2 versus Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal. How does Doom 64 fit into all of it? So um, overall, though, I am having a fun time with the game. There's certain parts that are easier and harder, so the um, Lost Souls are a little bit hard to uh, defeat, so I'm getting used to that. Um, especially with whether you to use a shotgun or the um, uh, machine gun or submachine gun. Um, the Caco Demons, which I think they are, look like don't look like Caco Demons. They look more like Caco Demons in white armor or white versions of the Caco Demons, and that. Um, enemy design, I don't, I don't really like. It looks kind of weird, unless it, it's, meant to, it's meant to be a new uh, version of the Caco Demon or something like that. Um, Lost Souls are okay. The um, Imps, I think, are actually decently designed. I didn't realize that, uh, that they, that's what they were in the initial parts of the game, but once you see them continuing to throw fireballs like the uh, Imps in Doom 1 and 2, then you realize that's what they are. It's not seeing them as fully brown imps is kind of weird and throws me off a little bit but now that i know that's what they are i actually like their designs the best um and then you have you know the machine gunners which didn't really require much of a redesign so you do and machine gunners and shotgunners so you do realize that um 
that's what they are right off the bat so overall decently done i think the pinkies are also not that greatly designed mostly because they're not pink they're more shiny and glassy like the Kako demon a little bit so it would have been nice just to have a pink um color palette applied to them but that's neither here nor there now that i kind of realize that that's what they're supposed to be then um that's nice and then i'm also liking the teleport the more individualized um teleportation system so rather than um the rather than teleportation pods being all over the place like with doom one and two you have that um demons of hell teleporting in from hell with the flame fire thingy and then um you as the doom guy have to use the doors to get through various uh, places in the level take the stairs and ladders to go up and down a little bit and all of that so in general it works so um like i said in general i'm having fun playing the game so um if you haven't seen any of those um videos they're up on the youtube channel in general they've been up every day except for a few random days to take time off like on weekends and stuff but um, they're posted there pretty regularly, so you can check them out on the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash n one The website for past episodes and stuff like that is up at uh, Headphones Nailed on Reviews with links to the social sites I'm on, past episodes, ways to subscribe, support the show. So um, if you want to get early access to the show, you can subscribe on the Patreon at patreon.com slash n one which also has a link to the video version version of the show so you can get that early as well so um which is also an ad-free version of the show for the podcast listeners so definitely a, lot, a few different benefits to get by supporting the show on patreon but that is all for this particular episode thanks for tuning in and until next time